upgrades, resignations, potential driver replacements. There is a huge amount happening right now in Formula One, and we are here to bring you back up to speed. Welcome back to the Grid Talk podcast. This is episode 283, and today we will be previewing the Emilia Magna, Emilia Romagna, I always get that bit wrong, Grand Prix in Imola. I'm your host, Tom Horrocks, and I am joined today by sports journalist and podcaster, Aaron Harper. Hello. The DNF1 podcast's Adam Burns. Hi, guys. And the Grid Talk equivalent to Helmut Marco. It's Tom Downey. Oh, of course. Hello. <laughs> That's brilliant. <laughs> And before we get going, we'd just also like to thank this week's episode sponsor, which is Bet Online. BetOnline.ag is your number one source for all basketball info, stats, news, and scores. Get the latest odds, lines, and including the latest player reports for this year's pro basketball playoffs. Bet Online is always your sports information headquarters for this season, as we have you covered for all your sports wagering needs. Basketball, MLB, NHL, hockey, right up to UFC and boxing. BetOnline is the fastest and easiest way to get your betting info, including live betting options and your favourite casino and card games. You can play right now from your home. Head to the website today or use your mobile device to get in on the action and be sure to use the promo code BELIEVE, that's B-L-E-A-V, to receive your 50% welcome bonus. Bet online, where the game starts. So we're moving on to the uh, before we move on to the preview itself. We've had a bit of news. It's not breaking news as such. It's all very much uh, all very much conjecture. So um, I'm going to come to you, Aaron, to talk about this this news about Ricardo. Uh, you're you're probably the most qualified here to say whether it's real or fake news. So uh, what's been going on? Uh, so I understand he went to a wedding in Italy, and he may or may not have stopped on his way to or from said wedding at the Alpha Tauri base in Fianza for a seat fit. Now, it's probably just all procedure to cover the bases of uh, De Vries injuring himself in one of the many crashes he seems to be having at the moment, or if Yuki Snoda is unable to race either. So it's probably all just procedure. It does add fuel to the flames of De Vries being under pressure, but Realistically, if Red Bull were to get rid of De Vries, it would make them look really silly for having hired him in the first place. It would It's a fairly bold hire to begin with because he's only done one Formula One race and it's not like he's come straight out of Formula Two. He's obviously been successful elsewhere in Formula E. And that's not to discredit Nick De Vries. He's a very talented racing driver. He just hasn't shown it particularly much yet in the Alpha Tauri this year. That being said, we do know how uh, trigger happy Red Bull can be with changing drivers, moving them between teams or just booting them out altogether. Just ask Daniel Kafia. So I, I, I think it's just procedure. It's just covering bases. But wouldn't it be interesting if Ricardo got in that Alpha Tauri and suddenly he realised how to drive a Formula One car again? Yes, absolutely. And he does have a test, I believe is at Silverstone. He's going to be driving the RB19 as a uh, as uh, for part of the uh, part of their testing program that they they're running. So it'd be inter- interesting indeed to see him behind the wheel. But Tom, getting your unique perspective on this being our very own helmet Marco. He's uh, there's been various rumors about him only having 3 races to prove himself. Um is, is it is it true? I'm asking you because you must know. Oh, yeah, it's Helmut Marko. I can't confirm that Nick DeVries will be sacked and Daniel Ricciardo will replace him. End story. Like, yeah, you know, it, it, yeah, it's always going to happen because anytime a seat, drive, uh, a seat driver goes for a fit, a driver goes for a seat fit. I'll try that one again. Um, sorry, I should be see just, yeah, that's what happens right, when you only have one eye, like Helmut. Um, it's, uh, you know, it's, uh, you know, any anytime... Um, uh, you know, a, a driver goes, goes for a seat fitting, the rumour mill just goes into overdrive. It's like... Daniel Ricciardo has also had a seat fitting at Red Bull because we've seen pictures of him in, in the RB19 and we know he's doing a test run. But, but all the people are saying, oh my God, is you know is Perez going to get you know sort of sat? I mean, uh, you know, I, I know there are obviously you know some people speculating that usually the diehard Danny Rick fans. Um, but no, <clears throat> I said this at the time about De Vries. In the yes, he got a point in that Williams in Monza last year, but Monza is a circuit where there are probably, I think, in total, about eight corners, seven corners, something like that. And 
it's it's a circuit which benefited that Williams because it was just straight line speed and you you, know, you just slap minimal wings on it and away you go. I said at the time that to get a proper measure of where he is, we knew we had Singapore in two weeks' time. I said, I believe on this show, that we should see him in the car at Singapore because that because he's gone from pretty much one extreme to the other. And if he could handle the sort of heat and the intensity and the pressure and the circuit of someone like Singapore, then Alpha Tari would be in a better position to judge where he is. Unfortunately, they've just gone, oh my God, he got a point in the Williams. Let's sign him up. I don't see them like, you know, you know, them like making rainbows or something because Albon got a point in the Williams in Australia last year. You know, they didn't suddenly start jumping through the hoops to, to sign him back. And, you know, you know, yes, it might be a little bit different, you could say, because he wasn't Alpha Tari driver. So it was Pierre Gasly. And they put Gasly back in the Alpha Tari. So what do you know? You know, it's uh I I think De Vries hasn't helped himself because he said, Don't judge me as a rookie. He is a rookie in F1. And yes, he's won Formula E, he's won F2, or you know, all the rest of it. F1 is different gravy. And he's not helped himself. He takes a while to get used to cars. You can't boat him out after a handful of races because Alpha Tower will be a laughing stock. Yeah, no, abs- absolutely. And I think very much a case of the, the, the shiniest thing made uh, made Helmut Marco and uh, and Christian Horner's eyes glint a little bit. And uh, and I wonder, is he going to regret not signing for Williams after all, as the rumour was he was offered a seat there. But we'll move on to this week's Grand Prix and staying with Williams. We'll come to you, Adam, to hear from you for the first time today. Uh, Williams, P10 in the constructors with just a single solitary point on the board at the moment. On paper, it shouldn't get any better this weekend for Williams, given their lack of down force but is there any hope for them and how do you think Sargent will fare against Albon given that he's raced here before a few times as well well that's one of the baked in advantages that you might be able to find if you're looking for any regarding the battle between Sargent and Albon at the moment with respect to Logan Sargent Alex Albon is currently driving on a different level I don't think that surprises many of us given how experienced Albon is in Formula One now seeing that as soon as he's got away from Red Bull he seems to have been able to mature a bit more, find a bit of a stronger character about him. And in the same way that Pierre Gasly did as well when he left Red Bull, uh, or was demoted from Red Bull, if you like, before him. So I think this weekend, I think we're going to see Williams in the same ballpark that we've seen him quite often this season. And that's well established in the midfield, certainly not the slowest by any stretch of the imagination, although right now they are bottom of the Constructors' Championship. And I think there is going to be a bit of a skill element at this circuit where Alex Albon may provide a surprise. We may see, as you mentioned already, Tom, from Logan Sargent's previous experience, this may be a a circuit that he may have set his eyes on and thinking, if I'm going to get a result that's going to impress the team or maybe even a championship point, it could well be here. So there's plenty of optimism for Williams right now. And ultimately, I think their progress has shown for a lot of F1 fans to be one of the highlights of these 2023 cars at the moment is that there's no real outlying back marker right now. This midfield can almost be a bit of a lottery and on certain days where certain drivers that do excel a bit more than others, as Alex Albon has proven to have done so for the last couple of years now, we may see Williams getting the points once again. Um, I mean, this is something I'll probably say about a lot of the teams in that midfield battle right now, that it, it literally is whoever does the best job on the day. So, so far, I would say, yeah, this weekend, I think Williams will definitely have their eyes set, maybe on a championship point or a decent finish. But the issue for Williams has always been race pace. In qualifying, they've been very impressive so far, or at least Alex Albon has been very impressive so far, um, qualifying near the top 10, almost got into Q3 in Miami, which obviously was some feat. But in the race, they do fall away a little bit. So perhaps that lack of ultimate downforce that they will need this weekend might hurt them, but we will see right now. And also it depends on strategy as well. I think there's a lot that could come into that. So uh, yeah, I think Williams will be looking at points. Maybe Sargent will get further up, but uh, it will be interesting to see how he gets on. Yeah, I completely echo what you say there. It does seem to be very much a Formula 1 and a Formula 1.5 at the moment where you've just got the top four teams and then you've got everyone else all mushed in together and it does seem that any point, any one of those teams could sneak into the points, but uh, there's not many points available. It's it's very much 
uh, in Leicester's retirements is very much the last last couple of points are the only ones available. But another team with just two points, their name Alpha Tori. We'll come to you now, Aaron. And um, they are ninth place with just the two points. We've already discussed the rumours around their drivers and uh, their team principal stepping away at the end of the season. More rumours of the sale just don't seem to keep going away. Team seemingly in turmoil right now. What's what's the way forward for them short term and how are they going to get on this weekend? Uh, short term, the way forward is do a very solid job at every race and get Nick De Vries to a level where he is close to the pace of Sonoda. Sonoda's actually got an advantage of three tenths of a second there or thereabouts in qualifying uh, over the four, well, over four races that you can legitimately compare them. Of course, De Vries crashed in Baku and was some 12 seconds slower as a result. Um, that's That's kind of their... Their short-term aim, keep Yuki Snowda performing well because he's done an excellent job so far this season, really one of the standout performers that hasn't been in a forward-running car. So to keep Yuki Snowda going and maybe grab those points, they're, they're kind of operating at the same level as Williams. Can they snatch up a point or two when they're on offer? We've already mentioned that there's not many points left on offer, especially if the, the top four teams all finish. Um, Miami was a bit of an outlier in that because Lance Stroll qualified out of position, didn't come through the field. So eighth place was, you know, on offer to the guys who were fighting in the midfield, which makes that position really, really valuable to them. And Alpha Tari want to get themselves in that mix. The rumours of a sale and Lauren Mecki coming in from Ferrari, they've got to negotiate how they get him out of Ferrari because they've been a bit trigger happy in classic Red Bull fashion with announcing that. So they've kind of put themselves in a difficult position in terms of their leadership and their future going forward. If he becomes the, the Alpha Tauri team boss, then they sell the team, then what? There's there's a big cloud over the long-term future of that team, which of course was Minardi, the, the plucky minnows um, of years gone by. So to see them in this position is a touch worrying, but it could open the door for a new brand to come and join the Formula One grid. Of course, Andretti want to join. I'm not saying, for an instance, that they want to buy Alpha Tauri, but other companies may want to do it. Honda are always looking at coming back to Formula One and then again leaving. So maybe they'll buy Alpha Tauri and Sonoda will stay. But Sonoda on merit at the moment should stay because his performances are very good. And I would expect him to be leading any hope of Alpha Tauri points in Imola this weekend. Yeah, and then from moving from, from Alpha Tauri to a team that very much does have its future very much laid out in front of them, it's Alpha Romeo, Tom. And uh, they, they obviously know exactly what their future holds and uh, and they're building towards that every single day. Uh, at the moment, though, they do sit P8 with just six points. Bottas and Joe, one of the most evenly matched pairs so far this season. Points seem less likely than last season, though. So how um, how do you see their weekend going? Um, not great. I think they'll probably both be knocked out in Q1, maybe one out in Q2. I mean, there's, there's no point being around the bush. They're not very good, are they, Alfa Romeo? You know, after, after the promising start they made last year, once all the other cars um, uh, managed to managed to get the weight of the car down, uh, all of a sudden they look bang average, and that's indeed what they were. Um, you know, uh, Bottas is washed up. Um, Joe is... Was arguably got the measure of him, um, you know. It's just you, you know the, the team is just treading water until twenty twenty five or six when I'll uh, I'll the Audi take over. Um, could you imagine that wrong uh, German brand there, Tom? Oh, I know. Yeah, I was close. Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, it starts. It starts with an A and ends with an I. Um, yeah. No. Uh, yeah. No. Um, uh, yeah. I forgot what I was saying. Um, yeah. No. Um, no. Uh, when Audi, that one, um, you know, come and come and take over, you know, it'll, um, I'd, I'd imagine that the team will, it'll be completely different from what we know it has today. Because at the minute, although it's called Alfa Romeo, that is just effectively a sponsorship deal. You know, it's still, you know, the, the chassis is still called the C, the C forty three, and it, you know, it's still used for powertrain, all the rest of it is, it, you know, all, all that stuff. When, when Audi come in, it's going to be a completely different outfit. So Alfa Romeo are in a weird one because they're sort of just like, they're sort of just like going around in circles at the minute, you know, not literally on, on the racetrack, you know, thank God my husband. Um, but, um, but, you know, they're, uh, they're, they're just, 
yeah, they're, they're sort of like in in a limbo phase because they're um you know they're they're just they're just not very competitive. Like um you know uh, like like Adam said earlier, you know there's a, there's no real back marker um you know because sometimes you know, they might you know they might sneak in, sneak into Q two or maybe sneak into Q three, um but they just, they just they just don't like um they they just don't like it when um uh when you know when they're that far down the grid. Tom, where does Terry Porsche fit into this future? He's Sauber Junior driver, um, and Audi obviously are coming in in twenty twenty six, and Porsche is leading the F two championship at the moment. Where does he fit into this? Because obviously, if you're saying that Bottas is is washed up and Joe's got the measure of him, where does Porsche fit into this? Um, Bottas sees out his contract. So I think he's on a three year contract. He's in he's in the second year. He he, he does next year. Um, Porsche either wins F2 this year, um, provided he doesn't keep driving into people, um, or, or and then does next year as an F1 uh, reserve test and reserve driver, does a bunch of FP1 sessions, test programs, or all, all the rest of it. Or um, they go to Bottas, now nah, make you done, go you know go um, go wax your muller and and make your chin, and then um, you know and then and then then they bring him in uh, for next season. Yeah, he's uh, having a good season, Porsche, and I think it's very much uh, make or break for him this year after um, coming in with such you know, such vigour and such uh, ex- explosivity, if that's even a word, in his first year in F2 and, and kind of stalled a bit after that. So he really does need to, to get a handle of it now and, um, and, and push on to Formula 1. So hopefully that he's going to get his chance because I think he's a very talented driver. But we'll, um, we'll move on from that. It's always great to hear your, your, uh, your takes on that, Tom. It's, uh, it's always, you can always tell when you've had your coffee or not. So, um, Adam, moving on to Haas. Uh, they uh, got a point last time out in their home race and eight points to Mass so far. Is this a good start for them, given Aston's emergence, or do you think they've left stuff on the table? I think there was probably the expectation from at least those lower down the midfield that Aston Martin in particular would make a step forward. I don't think any of us could have foreseen Aston Martin making the step forward that they had done to the point where they're now favourites of P2 at this point in time in the Constructors' Championship, or at the very least, Red Bull's biggest threat on race day. That being said, I think if you'd have said to Gunther Steiner that Huss would currently be P7 after five races in the F1 World Championship and looking pretty handy in the midfield on one day to the next, they probably would have taken that. And I think what's most important is that the decision to bring Nico Hülkenberg back in replacement of Mick Schumacher has proven to be a very, very good one, um, probably better than they could have anticipated. And going into this weekend's race... Kevin Magnussen also proven last time out in Miami that he seems to be returning to a little bit of form. He qualified on the second row. Now, of course, we all know that there were caveats to that because of how qualifying went down and then it was almost a bit of a lottery because of um, Charles Leclerc's red flag and, and the timing of it. But at the same time, it's good that he was able to consolidate that on race day. You know, he was naturally falling down the order as we were expecting him to, but he held his own very impressively, especially against Leclerc and Esteban Ocon as well. Ultimately, they both got him, but his uh, second stint on the hard tyres was very, very impressive the way he recovered that. So Haas will certainly take a lot of confidence in that. Hopefully Kevin can get his season going in the same way that Nico Hülkenberg has hit the ground running, who, by contrast, didn't have the best weekend in Miami either. He had a few crashes in qualifying, so obviously he'll want to you know, forget that, about that one very, very quickly. So... Yeah, I I think Haas will be happy with the start that they've made so far this season. But now is the time to push on. They've picked up some good points early on. As we already said, this midfield battle is very, very tight. They may have their sights set on McLaren and Alpine above them. But I think we can all agree on in terms of where we expect McLaren to be over the course of the season later on and where Alpine currently are and where we expect them to be. I think they are in the box seat for that C class of teams, the likes of them, Alfa Romeo, Alfa Tauri and Williams, for example. And this weekend, given the strengths of that car, I can't see any reason why they can't look at a point or two, but I think we probably all agree that their strengths are on the straight. So they will be looking to try and make some overtakes going into turn one this weekend and perhaps to defend. So if they can do a decent job in qualifying, given that on average, they're the second fastest car in a straight line at the moment behind the Red Bulls, or somewhere up there, I think they'll be they'll be hoping to have a good qualifying session and see how that does for the race. 
Yeah, and, and I think you know, I agree completely with, with Hulkenberg being. Uh, I'm eating my words on that one, well and truly, as I was not convinced by that as an option. But it's well, certainly... you're not the only one, Tom. I was a Mitch yeah. Macca fanboy, so uh, no, he <laughs> was wrong. So, but fair play to him; it needed to be done. Yeah, no, fair enough. And hopefully, Mick will get his chance in in a in a slightly more fruitful situation where he's not under so much pressure and, and not allowed, to, not basically, you know, not allowed to take risks because that's pretty much the situation he found himself in um and he's still still young still making mistakes so hopefully he will get another chance and who knows that that may well come along um i do think though with the uh in the last what 10 odd races we've had two mixed up qualifyings and in those two mixed up qualifyings we've had magnuson qualifying on pole and in fourth bit of a it might just be a coincidence but he certainly seems to get that first lap in in q3 and and that's the one that counted so um you never know it's uh, weather's always a uh, an interesting thing in Imola as well and it's a difficult track to overtake so we may see something similar this weekend we never know but moving on to alpine then aaron everyone's favorite uh, french super team a strong performance last time out for alpine and saw them pull level with mclaren for on just 14 points for the season so does their season start here or do you see more of the perceived underachievement lauren rossi has been uh, criticizing them for uh, well, it better start here because Omar Safnauer is like a football manager who's on a losing streak and has been given the the uh, the fabled uh, backing of the manager in the press. Yeah, we're never going to sack him. We're standing by our manager two weeks later. They're out the door. So Alpine need to pull something out of the bag. But the problem they're facing is that the top four have this vast monopoly of the points. So it's... It's really difficult for your top midfield teams, McLaren and Alpine, to really make the most of their machines. So it doesn't, on paper and in the championship stand, it doesn't look like they're really achieving. They Alpine, they really should have got big points in Australia. That's the one that's got away. Gasly was running an excellent P5. Whether you uh, put that down to the, the power of the DRS or not, he was there. He was there on merit. He was keeping pace with the Ferrari and the Aston Martin, not far behind Lewis Hamilton's Mercedes. So the pace is there in the car. They just haven't put it all together. And it hasn't come at the time when the big points have been available to them. So it is a tricky situation for them. I think they'll do okay in Imola as long as Gasly's car doesn't set itself on fire again or something crazy and you know they don't crash into each other but they've got two excellent drivers there very good midfield operators the problem they've got is there's just a real dearth of points available to them you know like i said earlier p8 was the best on offer in miami and that only gives you four points it's a bit of a herald back to the 90s where you had ferrari mclaren and williams if they all finished the race, they generally finished in the top six, which is all the points gone back in those days. So the rest of the grid are feeding off of tiny, tiny crumbs, and they are incredibly valuable. What Lauren Rossi wants his team to do is make sure they're the team getting ninth and tenth every week and being ready to pounce when one of the top teams, the top four teams, has a, an off day. If, I don't know, Sergio Perez shows a wheel up the inside of Max Verstappen and they collide, suddenly there's two places on offer, potentially. So, you know, they've got to be there to put themselves in the best position and take those points on offer. I was hoping to float a quick question to you guys on Alpine because I did an episode recently following on those comments that Lauren Rossi made halfway through the Miami Grand Prix weekend and what surprised me was not necessarily the assessment of the team's results where, you know, for different reasons, Gasly has had reliability issues or not, or didn't drive that well in Bahrain. Ocon made some mistakes. And then of course they had their own issues in Baku and obviously what went down in Miami was much better, but overall the assessment wasn't great. What do you make of the fact that he was so public about these comments? And at the same time, he was very much throwing shade towards Otmar Jaffna, a guy that he brought into the Alpine team last season, someone he talked up very, very highly. And now he, he, some of his comments were alluding to the fact that they're not afraid to make change. I don't want them to be comfortable by trying to settle for where they are. I want them to try and get P4, almost to the point where if things don't improve in the short term, 
he's trying to set this up so that Otmar Jaffner is going to get the blame entirely. Whereas I would say, well, you know, you're publicly scathing your team. And at the same time, you're the man responsible. Why then? Why is none of the blame being put on you? Uh, well, it might just be him trying to take some of the heat off of himself. Um, it, it did strike me as odd that it came out midway through a weekend. That's probably not advisable. But let's be honest, this Alpine, Renault, whatever they want to call themselves, have been kind of making noises about we want to fight for world championships by this year. We've got a 100 race plan. It keeps changing so that they they aren't afraid to make changes. And they they got rid of Cyril Abitabal and they brought in Otmar Safnauer. They didn't want to give Fernando Alonso the contract that he wanted and they lost him. They didn't do the right deal with Oscar Piastri. They lost him. It's just, it just seems a bit all over the place. They kind of know what they want, but they don't have the, the way of going about it sort of nailed down. Like, let, let's compare it to Mercedes. We know Mercedes are working really hard to make their car better, as are all the teams. And they had a bit of a, a self-reflection, a self-dressing down. They've changed people in, in person in, in key positions, but it hasn't been like a public lambasting of this person is at fault, this person's under pressure. It was much more subtle and much more caring, if, that, if that's maybe the right way to put it. I feel Alpine, Laurent Rossi is just like, you will change this up myself now or you will be out the door and we'll get someone in who can. So it, it doesn't strike me as the right way to go about it, but time will tell. They might make a change and suddenly it will work or they might have lit a fire under the team and suddenly they, they bring developments. But this all takes time and money and there's a cost cap and, okay, there's 20,000 races a season. You can't get it all done straight away. So it's, it does strike me as odd. I don't really see the point behind it. It's probably been said behind closed doors. It's nothing that can't be said there and kept behind closed doors. So it, it does seem a bit odd. Yeah, it's uh, certainly a strange way to operate. And uh, I, I, I've given up predicting what the uh, what the Endstone team will do because in various different guises, they've, they've, they've flattered to disappoint on many, many an occasion. And every time you get excited about the hype, they seem to take a step backwards. So... Uh, we'll, we'll see what how this how this pans out. This latest this latest strategy from uh, from the from the higher ups in the in the Renault organisation. But we'll move on to McLaren then, um, Tom. The McLaren upgrades seem to promise a little bit in Baku, but uh, certainly um, certainly looked like they were they were a reasonable step forward. But in Miami, we saw them amongst the slowest cars on the track, not even getting out of Q1, and the race not getting much better. So, which McLaren are going to turn up this weekend? Um, I hope it is the Baku outfit, but I highly, highly doubt it, to be honest. You know, they, they, like you said, they, they showed some promise, but then Miami, it just all went to pot. And I, th I think uh, Piastri was either P19 or P20 in, in qualifying. Um, and, okay, they got a bit unlucky at the start because obviously Lando got punted, like we talked about on the, on the the from the review show. But they just, they just seem like in this sort of like, they they don't know what the issue is because they'll because they brought an upgrade to Baku and okay it's a, you know the car had decent pace you know it, it looked alright and it was and they we were thinking you know ah oh, McLaren back and then we get to Miami and here we go again so you know it's just I I honestly don't know is the answer you know that they they could they could be like they could be like sort of upper ends a Q two. Or they could be down in the doldrums at the, uh, you know, sort of at um, at, at, at Q1. You, you know, it's uh, it's just, yeah, if it, you know, for, for any sort of McLaren fans, it's just got to be painful for, for them at, at the minute. And it's, you know, I, I've, you, you do have to wonder, like, how much longer Lando's going to stick it out because, you know, he, he signed this big, you know, like multi year contract. Um, and, uh, you know, off the back of 2020 or 2021. And then it's all just gone to pot. And yeah, it's, um, I, I, I don't know. I, I think they'll probably have another tough weekend because I think they're still trying to figure out what, what the issue is. Yeah, it's obviously it's no uh, no uh, it's no secret who the allegiances of at least half of this panel are 
uh, <laughs> for, uh, for for McLaren. So we're very much hoping for a, for a better weekend. Um, but somebody else who's obviously a big fan of uh, another team on this podcast is Adam, your team next, Ferrari. Another Jekyll and Hyde team. Ferrari sit fourth with 78 points. Leclerc and Sainz both look very ordinary in Miami. But given the track we're heading to, and your obvious, uh, your your obvious hope and bias. Um, do you think there's uh, their obvious qualifying advantage could see them challenge for potentially even a race wing this weekend? It's a really tough one to call because we've seen in back to back weeks the best and worst of the Ferrari SF twenty three this season, and you know when Leclerc is absolutely on it. And he nails it all together. He is absolutely breathtaking to watch and up there with the best that there is on the grid right now. But we end up with weekends like we saw in Miami, sadly more often than we probably should, where he's still trying to extract every little bit of performance out of the car. And unfortunately, the car just doesn't really have that working range where you can make the slightest misjudgment and get away with it. Now, at the same time, there are probably a lot of people that will probably say, well, Charles Leclerc doesn't need to wring the neck of the car every time he does a qualifying lap. But then that's how he drives the car. It's very Jill Villeneuve-esque. When it comes to race pace, we can all agree that the Ferrari is certainly lacking in terms of you know, being able to extract that one lap performance over the course of a race distance and manage its tyres to the same degree where it can be competitive all the way through a stint. So... It's a really hard one to call right now. Ferrari are bringing a lot of upgrades to uh, not only, you know, over the last few races, and this is going to continue until Barcelona, where I think we will get a good indication as to where Ferrari's aspirations will lie for the rest of the season. And beyond that, depending on how well these new upgrades on the car work towards their concept, they're still sticking to what they have rather than abandoning this car and going down the Red Bull route like Aston Martin did last year, and maybe something Mercedes in particular are seriously considering. So it's a tough one. I, I can't really lay a fair prediction on where Ferrari are going to be this weekend. As a Ferrari fan, I can just simply hope that we see more of what we saw in Baku, where Ferrari had a very clean weekend and there wasn't too many issues affecting the car, like wind direction changes, which was something that both drivers complained a lot about in Miami. So that car is very sensitive to changing conditions. If we have a boring, clean, safe weekend, we may see the very best of Ferrari and they may challenge for a podium. Um, Carlos Sainz, again, has been very consistent as well, but not necessarily a good consistent. Um, I don't think he was bad in Miami. I just think the car's faults exposed them quite badly. So I'll be honest with you, Tom, it's, it's hard to tell right now. We could get a good Ferrari or a bad Ferrari. And I sincerely hope in front of a home crowd that it's more the former, but um, it, it's it's fun in that regard, really. I know we're probably not going to win, but um, it's fun trying to feel where Ferrari are going to be right now. They, they surprise you more often than not, but not necessarily in a good way. Absolutely. And uh, it, no matter what your feelings are towards Ferrari, seeing a Ferrari win in Italy is always a sight to be seen. So it would be nice in a season when uh, it's looking like it's going to be fairly predictable race results. It'd be nice to get a good, you know, a good news story like that. You think back to 2019 and Charles Leclerc winning in Monza in a uh, in an unfancied Ferrari. Something like that would be would be a great image to, to look back on the season for at least. But uh, moving on to you then, Aaron, for the Mercedes team and a lot rides on this week and long-awaited updates finally arriving and how important is this update package for them this weekend and and how far do you think they can go well surely it's the long-awaited return of side pods to mercedes cars i mean surely the thing is going to have some side pods that look probably something like the aston martin if not a little bit red bullish so they're they're bringing some stuff um I think Mercedes are keeping their powder dry on just how good it's going to be. I mean, it could easily just bring them like a few tenths of a second. It could be, you know, we've seen it with Mercedes before. They've bolted something on the car and it's given them half a second. If you remember, I think it might have been 2019 where they had a bit of a ropey first test. They came with essentially a, a B-spec car for the second test in Barcelona and went on to have like five or six one-two finishes in a row to kick the season off. So it's not beyond this team, but just the way this car seems to be interacting with everything, it's taking a lot of unravelling for them. So they're doing the best with what they've got. 
they've arguably got the best driver pairing in Lewis Hamilton and George Russell, but they haven't given them the car to necessarily compete at the level that those two, with their respective abilities, maybe should be. Although every, no one has a divine right to just compete at the front the whole time. That's not how the world works. It's not how sport works. So it'll be very interesting. I think that'll be the big talking point over Mercedes. What are the upgrades? What have they brought to the car? How is it affecting performance? It's a very interesting circuit to bring the upgrades to. Maybe a safe choice because they could maybe have brought them earlier for Baku and Miami, which are street circuits and very, very different. And you don't get that necessarily that the high downforce sort of read, which is what they're going for. So Imola, will, the classic sort of return to Europe from the 90s and early 2000s is probably a, a good um, representation of where the upgrades are in terms of what they can offer. They're not going to do a back-to-back because the package is just too big. So Mercedes has a big question mark over them. These upgrades could go on the car. Well, I say upgrades. They could be downgrades because they might make the car slower. I mean, we've seen and heard a lot about uh, stuff in in sim and loop and virtual virtual. Uh, it's in the simulators and stuff like that, and it looks good there. But then you put it on the track, and it bounces up and down like a kangaroo. So let's wait and see. Um, it's going to be an interesting weekend with Mercedes. Just what does the car look like? That's, that's the first question. <laughs> I think there's going to be a lot of people tuning into FP1 to see just just what that uh, what that Mercedes looks like, but uh, the the probably what's likely to be the furthest forward car with a Mercedes engine, and it is the customer team Aston Martin, Tom, and they sit just six points clear of Mercedes despite the amazing start they've had and and the pace advantage they have had over Mercedes, just six points between them at the moment. Do you see this weekend as an opportunity for a win for Aston Martin, or will they be very much looking over their shoulder? Uh, I think they will be looking over their shoulder, especially if Aston, uh, sorry, if Mercedes, I should say, make the, um, you know, make the sort of plan progress that, that this update may or may or may not bring. Um, uh, you know, to Aston, you for all the sort of that hype and promise around the, um, you know, around sort of preseason when you know people are saying, could Alonso take, you know, could he, you know, fight for the championship, and, you know, could he do this and that and you know could he take Paul and all the rest of it it's like nah mate you know Red Bull are still the quickest team by a country mile this year and uh, I, I think Aston needs to sort of realistically look and say right you know we are scrapping for P2 in the constructors and we are you know we, we are scrapping for our you know one of our drivers Fernando to 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 be the you know to finish third in in, in the drivers championship um you would think there would be more daylight between them and Mercedes, but you know, people do like to sort of like you know, almost slag off Mercedes a bit at the minute because you know, you know, because they, they had so many years at the top and all the rest of it, and now all of a sudden, because they're not on pole winning every race, people like on oh, Mercedes finish, blah blah blah. They're still in the mix at the top, and you know, there's you know, Hamilton, you know, still on the podium, you know, Russell could have possibly won Australia, um, you know, so you know. Is it people are getting a bit overhyped with the with how how well Aston Martin is doing? Don't get me wrong, I'm really glad to see Aston Martin doing well because they're my favourite car brand you know, by a long shot. And given you know, sort of like how they started off, you know, in 2021 and then you know, 2022 was a, you know, pretty much years in the doldrums. Um, we, I mean, we could hopefully see. Um, you know, uh, we could hopefully see you know a good scrap between Alonso and um, and Hamilton again, mind. Um, if I can, just for a moment, can we talk a little bit about Lance Stroll? Because I feel like, as as you right, rightly pointed out, Tom, you know, as impressive as Aston Martin have been, I do feel like a lot or almost all of what has been good about Aston Martin this season, minus how good the car has been, is Fernando Alonso. And as a result of how good Fernando Alonso has been this season with four podiums and a P4, arguably, you know, pound for pound, probably the best driver on the grid at the moment. Um, I know some Max Verstappen fans probably won't appreciate that. And it's not fair to knock him just because he's in the best car. But all things considered, it's very easy to overlook how Lance Stroll's start to the season has been less than impressive. Now, I know he's had a few reliability issues. He's obviously had to recover from that injury that he sustained 
did he come back a bit too soon? I don't know. But right now, when we think of Aston Martin, as I said already, we're talking about all the great things Fernando Alonso is doing. He's giving Lance Stroll some advice when he's on the radio, which is something he has said that he's always done for his teammates. It's just F1 TV and the broadcast have decided after 20 odd years, now they're going to start picking up on it. So, uh, you know, make of that what you will. If there's a clause in his contract where Daddy Lawrence gives him a little bit of extra money for giving Lance coaching tips behind the wheel, I don't know. Make of that what you will. But I do feel of late, Lance's less than impressive performance. I think the overtake he made where Alonso watched on the TV and and asked what position was that for when he praised him, he said, I was P13 or something like that. And, you know, some of the, some of the other incidents throughout this season, it it does feel to me right now that Aston Martin is very spearheaded by Fernando. And uh, because of how good Fernando has been, Lance's less than impressive form has been overlooked. So, I mean, what do we make of Lance Stroll so far this season? I mean, am I being too harsh or is that something that might be a concern for them as this Constructors' Championship develops? Um, I I, right. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, I, th- I think you're right in that it's going to be a concern for them moving forward in terms of their fight with Mercedes and Ferrari because if, if Lance isn't pulling his weight in terms of scoring points or he's finishing eighth or seventh in that top four domination... Um, you know, it, it it's going to be very difficult for them to hang on to second place in the championship. But I think we're going to see Lance Stroll's proper level, especially against Fernando in a good car. Tom, you had uh, uh, something to say as well. So we, we spoke over each other. So I'll yeah. hand it over to you now. <laughs> no, it's all good. No, no worries, mate. No, it's my fault. Um, yeah, no, uh, uh, Adam, I think you made a very good point about Stroll's sort of, um, sort of like lack of pace, or you know, sort of like you know, his lack of results compared to Alonso, and um, and uh, if you think back to Baku when um, uh, when uh, uh, Stroll said, "Tell Fernando I'm not going to attack him," and then Fernando said, "You know, you know, tell him he can have a go if he wants." It's because Alonso knows that Stroll is not a threat, and he knows that he is considerably a better driver and a better sportsman and. And and you know he he is he is just the um he, uh, he he you know he is just a, a more sort of like complete driver and the complete package. The other thing you have to think is they've got Felipe Djokovic waiting in the wings, F two champion, and you know we talked about Teo Pochet with Salva. Um, sorry, Afromeo. Sorry, Aldi. Sorry, Audi earlier. Um, you know it's uh, yes, that was on purpose. Um, you, you know if you think you know Aston Martin may find themselves in a similar situation because Charles been in F one since 2017, and yeah, he's had one pole position which was outstanding in the wet, but he's just not consistent enough. And Aston Martin, now that they are right at the top, they might realise, hang on, if we really want to compete and you know get you know, P two in the constructors, Stroll, uh, you know, Lance Stroll is. Probably going to be the weakest link. Goodbye. Yeah, interesting. Interesting takes. They are way in as well. I mean, they've also got uh, Stoffel Van Dorn uh, waiting in the wings as well uh, as another proven F one. Maybe not. Uh, you know maybe not like championship contender, but certainly proven that he can be more than a match for Jensen Button, which is which is no mean feat at all. But my personal opinion on the stroll this year, I, I think I think with Fernando Alonso coming into a new team, he took a little while to warm up and uh and Stroll matching him whilst coming back from injury as well was was impressive. But since then, Fernando's found another gear and, and Lance is still kind of in that recovery mode. So I don't know if there is any long-term issues that he's facing or whether it is just overall talent. But... Um, but yeah, it, it's been uh, it's been less than flattering, definitely, well, we, after we look the start at Miami, of the season. Yeah, I mean, if, sorry, if we look at Miami as an outlier, you've got Stroll and Alonso separated by, what was it, 16, 17 cars? I mean, mm. Stroll puts it P18, gets out of Q1. Fernando puts it on the front row. And in the race itself, Stroll, I mean, we look at the two Mercedes guys, Russell and Hamilton, how they progressed through the field. Hamilton was on that harder tyre strategy like Verstappen was. Stroll was on that too. And Stroll only gets as far as P12 over the whole race distance and everything that came with that. So it is a concern for me. And that's why I wanted to bring it up because... Mercedes is six points behind Aston in this Constructors' Championship. And if you'd have watched the season and focused on what Alonso has been doing and what the two Mercs have been doing, you'd be thinking, how are Mercedes so close? And the reality is, is because they've got two guys getting points and big points on a regular basis. Even Hamilton not performing to Hamilton levels at this point in time, and then that will progress over the year. They're still in with a shout right now 
And for me, if Aston Martin can't find a way to raise Lance's level without upsetting the boss, um, they could relinquish P2 and they may look back on this season as a wasted opportunity if Mercedes and eventually Ferrari catch up to them. Yeah, I'll, I'll just throw a little caveat in there with, with Stroll's qualifying performance in that the, the track was ramping up so much that uh, that he was trying to get through on one set of softs like Alonso did and just didn't quite have enough pace. And on that, he uh, he, he just got caught out. And that was a, probably a badly advised strategy. But uh, even so, you still got to, you still got to put the car on track and do the time. So that's certainly not a pass anyway. But uh, we will move on from underperformers to overachievers then or, or just achieving in an amazing car. Red Bull then... Adam, uh, Max Verstappen firmly slapped his teammate back into line last time out, and uh, there doesn't really seem to be any weakness for the RB19. Can Checo take a fight to him this weekend, weekend rather, or is is it pretty much a foregone conclusion? I don't think it's a foregone conclusion just yet. Um, Sergio Perez will be massively disappointed that things did not go his way in Miami. I don't think it was as simply as Max Verstappen just did what Max Verstappen does and pulled together a brilliant drive. I think he did a really great job considering the circumstances he found himself in after Saturday qualifying. But at the same time, nobody anticipated that the strategy, the, the alternate strategy, if you like, on the hard tyres to start with, turned out to be the best one. They just never degraded. Max was doing 40 odd laps on them and was setting fastest laps later on in that stint. And, you know, Perez, he was kind of in a catch-22 situation. If he'd have started on, you know, he started on the mediums, and people were saying, oh, was that the wrong strategy? Did Red Bull, you know, deliberately put him on the wrong strategy to level the playing field? The reality is no, because if they're stuck in on, on the hard tyres, he'd have been fighting Alonso, Russell, Sainz on softer tyres. And they may have caused him some, his, some of his own issues in that opening stint would have jeopardised his chances of winning. So I think Perez was very, very unlucky in a normal race you could have played that so many times over he probably would have won but you got to give credit to Max Verstappen great job and that leads us into this weekend where Max Verstappen will have that momentum Checo Perez has just got to dust himself off go again hopefully he can on a much more narrow circuit he might be able to find some of that street smarts if you like that he's been so well known for throughout his time at Red Bull and you know, I don't think it's a foregone conclusion, but Perez has to respond very, very quickly because Max showed his hand a little bit of what he can do in those situations, like some of the greats have done in the past, like Schumacher, Senna, Hamilton, of course, Hakkinen a few times as well, and Alonso. Checo's got to raise his game again. So we'll see. But um, if we see a few more performances like that from Max, it could well be a foregone conclusion sooner rather than later. And let's just hope that you're you're wrong on that because we really do want a championship fight. But uh, with with Perez as the uh, protagonist in that uh, heroic fight back, I'm not entirely certain we're going to end up with the result that we want. Yeah, you know, nothing against Max Verstappen. We want it. We just want. We don't care who wins here. We just well to a certain degree we don't care who wins but we just want to see a good fight and uh, at the moment we're not seeing that unfortunately but hopefully hopefully Checo can come up Trump so moving on to predictions then Aaron I'm going to ask you for all in one go so we'll go for pole position your top three and a bold prediction to round it off for a bit of fun uh I, well I'd like to go Charles Charles Leclerc on pole position in in front of the Tifosi I think that would be fabulous but I don't think they're going to have the the pace to do it, especially through the corners. The, the, the straights in Imola are, are important, but the corners are equally so. Uh, so I'm going to be nice and boring and go Verstappen on pole, Verstappen to win the race, Perez second. Um, oh, third place, oh. <laughs> Lando Norris has finished third the last two years in Imola. So uh, um, that's your bold prediction, isn't it? That one? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. Uh, I'm going to go uh, Hamilton third, but it could easily be Alonso or Leclerc. And then bold prediction, I'm going to go with points for Williams. Nice, nice. Very good. Like that. Like that a lot. Tom, how about you? Um, Max is going to get pole. Uh, I think it's going to be a Red Bull 1-2 with Max leading them home. And P3, uh, I don't think Norris will be on the podium. Um I am going to say, uh, I've got a little bit of belief. Leclerc's going to get P3. Nice, I'm, nice. Bold, bold, bold prediction, De Vries keeps it out the wall. 
Wow, yeah, that is bold, definitely. Okay. <laughs> Poor Debris. <laughs> <laughs> he's got he's got three races. Everywhere. He's got three races to prove himself, apparently, <laughs> according to the Daily Mirror. Uh, Adam, your your bold prediction and your other predictions as well. Um so qualifying, I yeah, I'm gonna go somewhat bold with qualifying. I'm gonna go with Charles Leclerc to put it on pole if he gets the lap altogether. I mean, we saw him back who he was brilliant there. We saw in Miami. If he didn't make that mistake, he may have had a chance. He wasn't too far off Perez on the first run. And for my bold prediction kind of ties in with my top three. It's been, was it 10 years since Fernando Alonso won his last race at Ferrari? So yeah, in the spirit of that, I'm going to go with Fernando to win this weekend. Uh, this could be a circuit that they might be targeting that and Monaco as well. Uh, I think Fernando said Monaco, Barcelona. If, Red, if they managed to nail it in qualifying, they could win that race. So, yeah, I, I'm going to go with Fernando to win with Max. And let's go with Sir Lewis Hamilton, P3. Let's go really bold. So, yeah, Alonso to win is my bold prediction, of course. Well, that's uh, that's certainly a uh, certainly is a bold prediction, and uh, but to be honest, with the way things have gone this year for him, it would not surprise me at all. Fifteen points in every single race, even when he doesn't get a third place, he still picks up the extra points in the sprint race to keep that record of fifteen points going. So, so uh, yeah, that's fantastic bold predictions there, and predictions all round. Any one of those I would like to see as a, as a race result, apart from maybe Tom's, that was a little boring. But uh, anyway, if you have enjoyed this podcast, we would love it if you could leave us a five star review you uh, on apple podcasts and on spotify and if you're one of those listeners who have not subscribed to the channel please do so um you, if you click the bell you will never miss a show so you know when we're going to go live we've got well over 2,000 subscribers now on youtube so thank you for all your support and please consider sharing us with a friend before we go i'll just give our our co-hosts here a little chance to to plug their their channel so aaron tell us a little bit more about you uh so i am a full-time journalist i also do the AHGP uh, podcast, which you can find on YouTube and all good uh, podcast platforms. So you can find various videos about Formula One, uh, IndyCar, Formula E. Um, I, I go live with a live reaction after each Formula One race. I live stream, watch along with every Formula E race. Uh, I would do the same with IndyCar, but they're on a, unsociable hours. So I don't think my wife would appreciate that. Um, you can find me on Twitter at AHGP pod and Aaron Harper 41 on Twitter. Nice. And, and Helmut Marco, where can people find more from you? Uh, you can find me either in Milton Keynes or in Fianta. Um, no, um, I, uh, so I am a co-host alongside the good self, Tom at Grid talk, but I also co-host the formula talk show, which I do with Sophia um, where we look at F2, F3, F1 Academy, basically anything motor racing. Um, that comes under the Grid Talk uh, or the F1 Chronicle brand. Um, so, yeah, that's where you can also find me. Amazing. Always good to listen to those as well. And Adam, where can people find out more about DNF1 podcast? Uh, so we're pretty much everywhere. You go on YouTube, just type in DNF1, you'll find our podcast there. Talk about all things F1, similar to you guys. And you can find us on any major podcasting platform. And of course, if you do decide to check us out on there, leave us a five-star review. We'd really appreciate that. So uh, thanks very much, guys. And thank you for coming on as well, Adam. It's always great when when you're on. You're not on anywhere near enough, but uh, thank you very much for, for coming on. I know how busy you are, so that's uh, that's really great that you've come on today. And so all of our race shows do go out live on YouTube straight after the event. Previews come out slightly, um, uh, are not live, but they will come out normally a few days before. Those uh, live shows can be, found, um, can be found on YouTube, and our audio version is available on Amazon Fire, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Apple Music, Verbal, and Pocket Casts. We do also run a patreon so if you want to continue to help us doing what you're doing please feel free to throw some spare change at us everything does go back into the show and definitely doesn't go into the biscuit tin um, we will be back in a few days for the uh for the qualifying review of the imola grand prix so thank you very much once again to all our hosts and we will see you soon <laughs>